thinking about summer. <laughs> oh, I am thinking about summer. <laughs> I am thinking about all those years when we would go to a little house on the shores of the beautiful northern lake. And this was in a little town. And this town was, oh, it was a quiet place. But every single weekend, they had an event they called the fair. And it was a marvelous mixture. It was an art fair. It was a craft fair. It was a farmer's market. It was a lot of flea market. There was food and there was music. And it wasn't just local. People would come from the whole region. They would drive in in their vans and their campers and their RVs and their trucks. And they would park the trucks and campers and RVs all along the back of the Marina Overflow parking lot. And then they would set up the fair in the public park. They would put up their tents and their tables and their booths and their displays and their stalls. And it would be marvelous. You could spend all day and still discover more truths and more treasures there. And in fact, there was a woman who came every day. Every day the fair was on. She would be there in the morning when the vendors were just setting out their wares. And she would stay until dark when, she, when they closed up. And she always sat in the same place. She sat at a certain table up on the um, deck of the cafe that overlooked the park. And she watched. It was her main entertainment. Everyone knew that was her table, nobody else said it. <laughs> Until one day a stranger pulled a chair from another table, put it in beside her, and sat right there. <laughs> well, he wasn't bad looking. <laughs> she had sat next to worse in her life. <laughs> she said, good morning. This is the best table, isn't it, he said. You can get all the action from here. Action? Yes, he said, watch that woman in the yellow dress. The woman in the yellow dress threw up her arms. Oh, my purse, my purse, my purse is gone. Someone stole my purse. An excited crowd gathered around her. Now, said the stranger, the man in the red shirt. The man in the red shirt shook his finger at a vendor. You shortchanged me. I gave you a 20, and this was changed for a 10. You're a cheater. And the big size of the crowd gathered around that argument, too. The old woman looked at the stranger a little more carefully. Those were the pointy tips of horns poking through those glossy curls. <laughs> I do believe you are the devil himself, she said. Come to make trouble on a pleasant morning. Oh, you've got it, he said. Now watch this. <laughs> a group of teenagers came running into the crowd, pushing, shoving, elbowing, grabbing things off the tables, and it was pure. Well, you're a lazy devil, aren't you, said the old woman. Just do the easy things like this. I suppose you don't have the wits to do the hard ones. Excuse me, said the devil. I suppose you think you could do better? Oh, of course I could. I bet, she said, I bet I can do what you can't do and what's more. I can do what you think can't be done. I am very fond of bets, said the devil. <laughs> Good, she said. Then I bet. And if I win mean that, you agree to leave me alone forever. In fact, you agree to leave this place alone and everyone in it and to never return. And I suppose you want the usual if you win. 
<laughs> it's a deal, <laughs> said the devil. Oh, good, she said. Can you cause trouble between that couple of them there setting up the jewelry booth? Easy, said the devil. I have caused trouble between a thousand couples this morning already. There's <laughs> one more. And he glared at them. What are they doing? They were hugging. They were kissing. The devil glared harder. Now, he said, she's leaving it. But the young woman was just going back to their RV. And as she left, she blew her kisses. And he oh, blew her kisses. Uh, newlyweds, said the devil. You can't do anything with newlyweds. Give them 10 years and two kids, and I'll have them. <laughs> Well, I will have them ready for divorce tonight. <laughs> now remember your agreement. And she made her way down to that jewelry. It was costume jewelry, you know, sparkly but not special. And she looked at it and said, young man, young man, I'm looking for something special, but I don't believe you have anything here. Well, he said, tell me what you like, and maybe I can find it. Oh, it's not for me. It's for my son. Well, well, it's not really for my son. Well, it, well, this is complicated and a little embarrassing, she said. But you see, my son has fallen in love with a married woman, and he sent me here to buy something special for her, something that no one else will have. But I don't think. I don't approve, said the young man, but I have something. <laughs> he pulled out a jewelry box. He opened it, and there, nestled on the satin inside, was a gleaming silver pin. It was beautiful, intricate, elaborate, and elegant. And look, it's signed by the artist, and this artist only ever makes one of each of her designs. So no one else will have one like her. It's perfect, said the old woman. I'll take it. And she went away with that box in her bag. Straight back to the parking lot. She walked among the trucks and the campers and the vans until she came to the young wife sitting in front of her RV. And as she came, it was. Oh, oh, I feel faint. <laughs> oh, I think I'm going to fall. <laughs> and the young woman jumped up and propped her up. Oh, come inside. Come inside. Sit down here. I'll get you a glass of water. You will feel better. And so, as the young woman went to get the glass of water, the old woman reached into her bag and took out the jewelry box and she put it where it would be not obvious, but noticeable. <laughs> she went back to the devil and said, now tonight we must follow that man when he goes home. And that is how the old woman and the devil came to be standing outside the RV when the husband noticed the box. That looks like the box I sold out of the room this morning. Huh? Couldn't be. But inside, that pin, unmistakable. And what did she say? What did she say? Her, her son, in love, taking gifts to a Married woman, his <laughs> wife. You could hear him yelling from one end of the parking lot to the other. <laughs> he was raging. He was accusing. She was totally, totally taken by surprise. She was protesting. She was 
pleading with him to, to come to his senses and he had proof and before you knew it, he had pushed her out of the RV. I'm never going to see your faithless face again. And she was sobbing and crying and one of the vendors took her into the camper next door to comfort her. And the old woman looked at the devil. Well, she said, have I done what you couldn't do? You are indeed a devilish old woman, said the devil. <laughs> but I'm not that, she said. No, now I'm going to undo what I just did. Do it? You may get them back together. There is no way. Didn't you hear the names he called her? She is never going back to him. Oh, said the old woman. I will have them in each other's arms tomorrow. The next morning, she went to the jewelry booth. Young man, do you remember me? I certainly do. <laughs> oh, do you remember that pin you sold me? I'll never forget it. Well, I need to buy another one because you see, I lost that one. You what? Well, I lost it. You didn't give it to your son. Oh, no, he's so mad at me. That's why I have to buy another one. How'd you lose it? Well, you see, I got faint, and this nice woman took me to one of those arbies over there, and while well, I was digging in my bag for tissues, you know, and I must have taken the box up and just forgotten it. An RV? Yes, she said, and I can't go find it because they all go like to me. I don't know which one it was. It was mine, he said. It was, it was my army, my wife, my, oh, here, here, he said, you're going to buy another pen. He pulled the jewelry box out, shoved it at her. Go on your way, he said, I have something I have to do. And he closed his boots. He ran through the crowd. He pounded on the camper. He was begging her, please, please, could she forgive him? Please, could you come, she come back? It would never happen again, and the door opened. And the young wife fell into his arms because she really and they were crying, and they were, they were kissing, and they were protesting their eternal devotion and love. Yes, yeah, said the devil. <laughs> oh, love, said the old woman. And now, she said, looking at the devil, I have done what you could not do, and I have done what you thought could not be done. I think I've won the bet. <sighs> Maybe. Well, she said, shouldn't you be on your way? <laughs> Lesson learned, said the devil. Never bet with a wily old woman. <laughs> and he was gone. Just like that. Now you, if your travels take you to a small town on the shores of a beautiful northern lake. And if you discover that that town has an event they call the fair every weekend of the summer, please go visit it. <laughs> you will find it the most pleasant place you've been. Everyone is so harmonious. Everyone is so happy. There are smiles on every face, even the face of the old woman sitting up there at the table overlooking the park. And you will think to yourself, it is just as if this is the one place in the world where the devil never visits. <laughs> about this story. It is a very old story. It is a story that was told hundreds and hundreds of years ago. 
And what I have done with this story is what traditional storytellers do. When they take a story that is not of their own culture and not of their own time and not of their own place, and they recast that story in their own culture, time, and place. It is like people who move from one place to another, and they eat new foods, and they see new things, and they do new actions, but they are the same person. <laughs> the story at its heart, at its spirit, it is the same. I will tell you that I got this from a book called The Serpent Slayer. And this story is one that um, was originally collected and retold in a book called Arab Folk Tales. As far as I can tell, it's as far back as I can trace it. And that is only the 70s. Uh, and then it was also collected. So that, that collection uh, highlighted tales from the Middle East, but this one was from Palestine. And it was also collected in a book called Egyptian and Sudanese Folk Tales where it was credited as a Sudanese story. And as you can imagine, the details of those stories reflect their time and place and culture, mm -hmm. just as mine reflects my time and place and culture. And that is how stories move from my place to mine. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> and this is a story. She, uh, Jane told you about the serpents, uh, the serpent slayer story. Uh, this is a version that I found in this not one dance with in distress. Um, it, and it, for any of those who are not watching the clock, it's about four minutes till. <laughs> Now, serpents, and this is a Chinese story, I should, I should preface this. Serpents are not dragons. Dragons in the Chinese culture are good. Snakes, not so much. And there were mostly the snakes lived in the mountains. The serpents lived in the mountains. And they lived in these clefts in the mountain, and, and, and mostly they stayed to themselves, uh, eating uh, rabbits and, and mice and maybe the occasional deer. But there was one serpent who decided to broaden his aspect, and so started crawling out on moonless nights. And he was crawling down to where people kept their flocks. And he would, <coughs> she, <coughs> the oxen. And it was reported, finally, that he almost ate one of the magistrate's daughters. But she got away from him and told the tale of who was eating the livestock. Well, the village called for the military to bring in some soldiers to take care of this serpent. And so 10 soldiers marched to the mountains. And one marched back. Oh. And he told a tale that was grisly of the soldiers and the serpent. Now, the serpent was enjoying all of this and the discomfort of the people, and, and through magical ways, he, he communicated with the seers and the charlatans and the wise people in the village to let them know, if you 
send me one young succulent maiden every year on the eighth day of the eighth month. And I'll leave your flocks alone. <laughs> well, what could they do? What the town fathers did was they started sending one maiden a year up to the mountains. Usually it was the daughter of a, of a criminal or the daughter of a poor servant. And the girl's hands would be bound behind her back, her, her legs bound together, and she would be sent, carried off to the mountains and left for the serpent. Every year. Every year for nine years this happened. On the tenth year that town fathers were looking for their next <clears throat> sacrifice, and one young girl in a family of six daughters said, this isn't right. And she told her parents, send me. Oh no, no, we love you. <laughs> I am the sixth daughter of a family. I am a daughter. And in China, at that time, girls did not count for much. And they said, no, 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 no. And she said, I'm going. <laughs> and Sneaked away one night, presented herself to the town fathers, and, and they reluctantly but gladly accepted her. And she said, I don't want anything on my wrist, I don't want anything on my ankles. All I want is a sharp sword and a snake killing dog. There were such a thing as snake killing dogs. Looked a lot like chows. <laughs> and so they gave her one sharp sword and one snake killing dog. And then soldiers led her up the, into the mountains to where the serpent lived. You can leave, she said. I'll be fine. <laughs> And the soldiers <laughs> gladly left. <laughs> now, the girl had been thinking ahead, and she had packed some sweet rice bowls with covered with malt sugar. And she took this, this sack of these rice bowls, and she stacked them in the cave entrance where the serpent lived. And then she called, I am here! <laughs> And a servant with a head as big as a barrel looked out. Ah, dinner. So 
sword in hand, and he died. Well, of course, she was a heroine. She went back to her village, and they proposed that she marry one of the wealthy young men. Nah. <laughs> But her family was held in good stead. Ballads were written about her, and the emperor of the land heard about her and made her one of his administrators. And that is a story from China, an abbreviated one. Thank you for hanging on for five minutes <laughs> from this book, Not One Damsel in Distress. Uh, which is by Jane Nolan. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we had a great time looking for these these stories and uh, looking for stories of strength in women. And we all know that you possess such strength and resilience. And so we thank you all, guys. Thank you. And. Uh, uh, we hope you had a good time. Uh, thank you. Oh, did anybody have questions? We have these things we can throw at you. Oh. <laughs> oh, please! Ask a question. Oh, see, she already knows this. She's not surprised at all. Oh, see, what has been your favorite part of becoming a professional storyteller? Well, it's not the money. <laughs> um, for me, I was when I when I was your age, I was a speech and drama major with uh, and English, and uh, became a teacher and. Um, I didn't know anything about storytelling, particularly. Uh, maybe it hadn't been invented yet, I don't know. No. <laughs> and, and when I came to um, uh, Bloomington, uh, having gotten my library science degree in Kansas, <clears throat> came here, and one of the requirements of working at the Monroe County Public Library was you had to do storytelling. And I said, hmm, I don't know what that is. And so I have found it. The favorite part of it is getting to perform and uh, something that I enjoy and sharing the stories and even, even doing the research. You know, you've got to read a lot of stories to find one that works. I mean, you'll read, you'll read through all the entire story and say, this is great, this, and then it'll have this kind of ending that kind of goes. So, <laughs> my, and I get to work with my friend. <laughs> And the other? What kind of gigs do you usually get for storytelling? What kind of gigs do you get? Well, we get two kinds of gigs. The ones we make up ourselves, <laughs> like winter telling and the festival of ghost stories, and this year we're doing a summer story. So we get that kind of gig. And then we get gigs where people invite us. So I go down to Steinsville in October, and I told stories to fifth and sixth graders. Um, I, we get invited to events like this. We get invited to TC Steel every yes, year to tell stories at the TC Steel State. State Parks. Ghost stories are very popular. There are some gigs, though. Don't invite me to your birthday party for your funeral. I've done that. Don't invite me to your reenactment of the Civil War oh, gosh. or your Highland Games where people are doing explosive or loud things <laughs> right outside the short time tent. There are memorable kids. Yeah, yes, we, we, were, we were positioned, uh, was it uh, Green Castle? We were positioned right next to the cannon. <laughs> that they were firing off every once in a while. That doesn't seem well thought through. Huh? That doesn't seem well thought through. Yeah. Well, sometimes, sometimes 
people don't understand what storytelling is. You know, and they say, oh, it'll just be, well, I don't, I don't know what they imagine, or that you're going to read books to people. That's the main thing they say. Mainly they say, are you going to read books to us? No. <laughs> the thing that I loved about my job at the library, um, I started in 1969 at the Royal Free Public Library. And my mentor there, Barbara Miller, who was the first African-American head of a major uh, library's children's services in the South, uh, she was my mentor in storytelling. And one of the things I did not know about storytelling was that it created connections that were instant and that I could not get any other way. I would be the only white face in a downtown school, and the kids would listen because of the story. The story happened. So, mm -hmm. was... probably have one minute for a question. One more question, maybe. I don't need a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Could toss it up, and whoever catches it has to <laughs> say something. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> There's a storyteller herself, right there in green. <laughs> I want to thank you both so much for coming and sharing your authentic, amazing, wonderful stories. I just really have a question. Other than, would you like a copy of the history of the School of Education from? I like oh, I, I, I'm, you know, I know what my husband's going to for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I look forward to looking through it and seeing old friends. Yeah. No, my husband actually got his uh, IST degree uh, oh, yes. in education here. Oh, yeah. Here, well, not this building. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a long time ago. That's my department. Yeah, yeah, so, and then he was a library science professor for the rest of his career here at IU. So, we were the lucky ones who got to move here and didn't know we'd get to stay, but we did. Thank you again. Thank you.